we are glad that you are in the house of the Lord, and you have come to God's house, and we have felt his presence already. Amen. We are focusing throughout this month on what we believe, and um, this morning I'm going to do another lesson on what we believe. Revelation chapter 3, and I'm going to begin reading with verse 14, and unto the angel of the church of the Laodiceans write, these things saith the amen, the faithful and true witness, the beginning of the creation of God. I know thy works, that thou art neither cold nor hot. I would that thou wert, or I would thou wert cold or hot. So then because thou art lukewarm and neither cold nor hot, I will spew thee out of my mouth. Because thou sayest, I am rich and increased with goods and have no need of nothing, and knowest not that thou art wretched and miserable and poor and blind and naked, I counsel thee to buy of me gold tried in the fire, that thou mayest be rich, and white raiment, that thou mayest be clothed, and that the shame of thy nakedness, nakedness do not appear, and anoint thine eyes with eye salve, that thou mayest see. As many as I love, I rebuke and chasten. Be zealous, therefore, he says, and repent. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If any man will hear my voice and open the door, I will come in to him and will sup with him and he with me. To him that overcometh will I grant to sit with me in my throne, even as I also overcame and am set down with my father in his throne. He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. Amen. You may be seated this morning. Last Sunday, uh, we spoke about uh, the love of God and how great his love is and the need for restoration and reconciliation was what we focused on Sunday night. We had our missionary come on Wednesday and preach to us about empty vessels and how God can use just what we have. And he even mentioned in that service what about the ministry of reconciliation? That was interesting how that was spoken of during his preaching. Um, and God was setting or letting us know that, uh, of course, everybody has the ability to speak restoration, reconciliation into people's lives. Uh, this morning, I'm going to focus on this passage. Um, of course, this passage is usually preached in the idea that there's issues within the church. Um, but I want to show you the key word and bring a message, hopefully this morning, that will be helpful in some way um, concerning what we believe. The key word in this passage is, it comes from verse 19. And the key word in that verse is the word repent or repentance. And that is absolutely part of what we believe as a church. Now, a lot of times when we start to think about repentance, we think about people who are on the outside looking in, who their lives are messed up, uh, they've got a lot of things out of order, they're they're in need, they're desperate, they're, they have fallen somehow, they have messed up their life, and they need to repent. And without question, that is, that is true. We preach that, that no matter where someone has come from, where they have been, what they have done, that if they repent, the Lord is just to forgive them of their sin. We preach that. We believe that. But I want to bring your attention to this passage this morning because he's not talking to the outside. He's talking to the church. He's speaking to one of the seven churches that John wrote to that the Lord was given instruction to. 
There was many churches during this time, but he picks out seven, and one of the ones that he picks out is Laodicea. Now, I want you to notice that uh, it starts out, the angel of the church of Laodiceans write, and he says this, these things saith the amen, the faithful and true witness, the beginning of the creation of God. It's coming from a very high source. The words that are being spoken are not just from anybody. But Jesus is speaking words to this church that they must heed to. They must listen to. He says, I know your works, that you're neither cold nor hot. Now, I have to be honest with you. I've been in, obviously, I've been in church all my life. And I've always heard this passage preached on the idea that you're either hot for God or you're cold for God. (laughs) I've always, anyone with me? I always heard it preached that way. So interested. And that's good preaching. Don't get me wrong. But that is actually not at all what the passage is talking about. He's not talking about the sense of people being cold spiritually or hot spiritually. Actually, um, during this time, cold was good and hot was good. He's actually talking about water. And he's talking about the city of Laodicea and what they would fully understand when he's speaking about hot and cold. So Laodicea was a very wealthy city. They were in the middle of trade. They were in the center of people coming through and trading. They were high up in the banking system. So they were a very wealthy city. What's interesting about Laodicea is that they are one of the first cities to have aqueducts that bring water into their city. They had created this incredible feat of the time to bring waters from the mountains and from Philippi into Laodicea. They also had hot springs that were in this city as well. And so they had two sources of water that had many qualities. Now, you know and I know that cold water is good. I know if you get a little older, you might drink hot water, but nothing like a cold glass of water. I mean, cold is good. You don't put hot water in your drink to cool it down. You put ice cubes. Cold water. (laughs) Yeah, ice cubes. That's a good thing. Most people even maybe have a few of those in your freezer ready. For use. That's not bad. Nothing bad about that. Anything bad about ice cubes? (laughs) No. Positive. Uh, There's even wonderful blessings to hot water. When we were in Africa, it was nice to get up in the morning and actually have hot water. (laughs) Nice to have hot water. Okay, If if you run out of hot water, you actually think there's a problem. Something has happened. Someone has used the shower way too long. Hot water. There's benefits to hot water for cleansing, whatever the case might be. So there was good with cold and good with hot. And so the the Lord's not speaking in the terms of, well, you're cold spiritually, so you must be bad. (laughs) No, that's not what he's actually saying. Or you're hot spiritually, so you must be good. Now, I've honestly, we've heard it preached that way, and I understand that idea. You need to be red hot for God and fervent in prayer, and that's a good thing. That's a good message. But that's actually not what is being said here. So the city of Laodicea and their their incredible feat of bringing aqueducts into their city, uh, they were, were kind of spoiled. Do you notice that? 
Like, you know, we go to the tap and we turn it on and they have water. That wasn't always the case. <laughs> there, was, there was great things that were done by societies before to have water on hand, which we would think today was just silly because we take it for granted what we had. So what's being brought across with the Lord's message is that the water was cold when it left the mountains. It was clear, clean, and cold when it left the mountains. But by the time it got to Laodicea, through the aqueducts, it was no longer clean, cold, and clear. The same deal with the hot springs. They were hot, and there was warmth to them, and I'm sure steam maybe even coming off of them. But while they went through the system, the aqueducts, they didn't remain hot and clear and clean. So even though they had created this incredible feat of bringing water into their city, which would have been a great thing of the day, by the time that it got to the pools where it could be used, it was no longer hot or cold. It was actually lukewarm. And so the Lord's using, he's using this illustration of what they are like. And he says, I, I, I worked that you were either cold or hot. <laughs> you had great qualities with water from the mountain. You have great qualities of water from the hot spring. But when it gets all together and it becomes lukewarm, it loses those benefits. So that's the setting of what's being spoken about. And so he goes on. He gives them no commendations. There's nothing good that he actually says about them. You can read it. He says lots of condemnations. He's got lots of things that needs to be corrected. But he doesn't give them any positive input. And so he says, because thou sayest that I am rich and increased with goods and have need of nothing... Knowest not that thou art wretched and miserable and poor and blind and naked. He says, they've reached the point in their church that there is really not the need of the option of God. See, they have options on their own. They have not reached the place where God is their only option. They have become wealthy. They're a banking city. They're in the middle of trade. They are one of the first to have aqueducts. They got cold water coming. They got hot water. They have reached this place where in their society, they were the place to be. That's what he says. And so he doesn't talk anything positive about them. He says, listen, you're so busy as a church, that you're not hearing the knocking at the door. So how do we bring that to today? Because that can happen to us that we, he's not talking about cold or hot in a spiritual sense. But we become the mundane of our walk with God where it becomes a lukewarm process. And God has blessed us. He's blessed us with a lot of things. You say, well, I don't have what someone else has, but I can guarantee you have a lot more than three quarters of the world. You're a very blessed. We're a very blessed people. We're actually blessed in New Brunswick today. <laughs> Most churches are closed. <laughs> we're either blessed or foolish, one or the other. I'm not sure. But we're blessed. We're very blessed. And we have options, and we get to a place where we have options, and God is not the only option. And the danger of that is, he says, you don't even realize that you're actually miserable, naked, poor, blind. You've got a system that's set up in our life, our church, our family, whatever the case is, where 
we can solve it. We can come to the reasoning of what has to happen and whatever the case is. And he considers that to be a lukewarm state. He said, I counsel thee to buy of me gold, tried in the fire, that thou mayest be rich in white raiment, that thou mayest be clothed, and that the shame of thy nakedness do not appear, and anoint thine eyes with eyes have, that thou mayest see. He, he suggests, he tells, he admonishes, he gives them instruction that there's some things that they have to have. This verse 18 is a powerful verse because it, it speaks to them when he's speaking about white raiment. They were actually distinguished in Laodicea by their clothing. They were known of what part of their society they were by what they wore. He says this identity that they had, they needed new clothing. They, they had such abilities with their city that their eyes had become blinded spiritually. And they needed eye salve. To put on. It wasn't because they were blind naturally. They were doing great. I mean they, they built aqueducts. Okay. I mean we would just lay down pipe. They didn't have pipe. Okay, they're building this out of brick and rock. and They're building aqueducts for rock, water to come in. I mean they've got great talent. But he says they're blind. They, they have allowed all of this great stuff to, to blind them spiritually, and they needed eye salve. Eye salve to put on, to remove the, the scales, the blinders, the, the lack of being able to see. He, he then also says, um, and he speaks about the shame of being removed with their New clothing, not speaking about happen to have new clothing naturally. He's speaking about their identity. And then he uses this first phrase, I counsel thee to buy of me gold tried in the fire. The purifying of the gold is done in the, in the fire. The actual purest of gold is clear. We, we get excited and we... Got my little ring on here. Shows I'm married. It's gold. Very little gold. <laughs> it's actually broke in the center right now. Might have to get that fixed sometime. It's, I don't know. It's not too many carrots in there. <laughs> the clearest of gold is the purest. And he says... I want you to buy for me, offer to me the purest of your motives, your intentions, your desires, your purpose. He's speaking to the church. Now, this is all good stuff that we would say to someone that just came in off the street who's addicted and never known God. And Yeah, that works. But it works for me who's been in the church all my life, that if I'm not careful, I can become self-righteous. I can become so accustomed to the church. I can become so entrenched in the tradition of Pentecost that I lose the importance of what we believe in repentance. Oh, they need to repent. Yes, they need to repent. Yes, they're not living right. Yes, they don't talk right. Yes, they don't look right. And the Lord's speaking to me and says, you think you have need of nothing, but you're blind, you're naked, you're poor. Your intentions, your motives are not pure. And repentance is necessary. We cannot lose the importance of repentance in the church. It's easy to preach it in a Bible study. 
It's easy to tell it to someone on the street. And don't get me wrong. That is correct. But the Lord is saying this. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. Not to the outside. He's talking to the inside. I'm at your heart's door and you don't even know. I don't want to be in the church and not be able to hear his voice or the knocking of his spirit on my heart's door because of my lack of repentance. What do we believe? Yes, we believe we are here to reach the lost. Yes, we do believe we're here to reach the sinner. But we also believe that the child of God, the saint of God, the one who's been serving God for however long, cannot lose the necessity of repentance. The Lord speaks and he says, as many as I love, I rebuke and chasten. He's not, he's not saying that he doesn't love you, he doesn't like you. No, he says, as many as I love. Because he loves you, because he loves me, he corrects me, he chastens me, he disciplines me, and brings me to a place again of repentance. Paul said, the goodness of God leadeth thee to repentance. I could bring up plenty of verses this morning about repentance. And how repentance is for the lost. And how repentance is for those who don't know God. And, and, and I, I understand that's all true. Peter preached it. And they said, what do we got to do? And he said, you got to repent. He was preaching to the outside. But Jesus uh, here in Revelation is preaching to the inside. And we must be careful. That we believe and understand what we believe. That repentance is not just for people who have no walk with God. But repentance is for people that have a relationship with God. And on a regular basis, we fall. We, we fail. We come short of what God really wants in our life. And because of that, I have to continually come back to him and offer him the purest of motives, uh, things that are tried through the fire of the Holy Ghost, that I allow the identity that I have in him to be renewed and refreshed. And because he says this, my robes are no comparison to his. He gives me a robe of righteousness, but mine is just filthy, dirty. And he explains that my heart is desperately wicked. My mind needs to be transformed on a continual basis. And I must die every day. And This is a walk that I have to do with him on a regular basis. And it's not a week-to-week -week thing. It's a... It's a day to day, an hour to hour. It's a walk with him that I, it doesn't matter how long I've been in the church. He says, I've got to repent. And he's saying that to as many, as many as those that he loves. We have to ask ourselves questions like, you know, how are we going to get to where God wants us to get? We pray. We seek God. We want to get closer to Him. But how am I going to get to where God wants me to get? And it's through this key word on a continual basis of realizing that I fall short. See, if I'm not careful... I can be in the church and think that it's only for those not. The Lord can be knocking on my heart's door and me not here. Oh, there's examples. So Peter's in prison. 
And they're praying for Peter to get out of prison. They're all gathered together. The church is together. And they're praying up a storm. And God performs a miracle. And Peter comes to the door of the house of where they're praying. And poor little Rhoda answers the door and tells them that it's Peter. And they don't believe her. What? The church was praying for Peter's deliverance. He's standing at the door. I can just, have you ever thought of those stories and kind of pictured them in your mind how it must have been like? She didn't even invite him in. He's knocking. If you lived in Cushmacquack, you wouldn't have knocked. You just would have went in. <laughs> He's knocking. Rhoda comes to the door, opens it up. I can just hear this scream of excitement, so excited that who she saw was Peter, that she slammed the door, went in to tell the people what we've been praying for has happened, and no one believes her. Peter's standing outside the door. See, that happened, and that happens to us. We're praying. We're seeking God. We want a greater walk with God. We want to know him better. We want to be closer to him, and he's knocking the whole time. But because we become so immune to the presence of God, the spirit of God, the voice of God, he's knocking, and he's just wanting us to open the door to let him come in. But we're, we're so consumed. Well, you know, it's for the outsider. It's for the person who doesn't know him. It's for the other person. It's No, he's saying, Brent, you need to repent. Open the door so I can come in and sup with you. It's good for everybody else. Don't get me wrong. It's for everybody. But it's also for you. It's also for you. That's not selfish. No, that's not selfish at all. You're his child, just like everybody else. See, we got to be careful that we don't measure ourselves by our intentions and others by their actions. You know what? You need to act upon this because of how bad you've been. And we measure the person by their action, and we measure ourselves by our intentions. And the Lord's saying, no, no, the action is for the church just as well as it is for the outsider. See, how is it that I worship God? Do I worship him as, as if I have everything or do I worship him as if I have nothing? How do I pray? Do I pray with an expectation because I have a right? Or do I pray with the anticipation because of who he is? See, the line between serving God and Satan, that's clear. I don't think we have any issues with that in here this morning. Good. Good. Online, hopefully that's okay too. There's no problem with the line between serving God or Satan. The line is not as clear when we're serving self. Just getting a few nods. See, what happens is I make these statements just because I'm going to bring it back. Because if we don't, if we're not careful, that's how we'll treat repentance. Self-serving, 40 years ago, I did it. Clarified. I made a major mistake 10 years ago. Come to the altar for that. 
And the Lord's looking at my life and says, you have a long ways to go yet in me. He's not highlighting it to make me look bad. He's just saying, you are not even close to what I have for you yet. And so my intentions and actions and my self-servingness and how I worship God and how I pray and what I expect, and all of those things, is it through the eyes of repentance? Or is it through the eyes that I have attained a position in God after so long? God is going to reward according to your faithfulness and your deeds. But heaven and salvation is not based upon how long you have been saved. It's not. It's not based upon how many decades you've been in the church or if you grew up in the church. Or it's not based upon any of those things. It's based upon my idea of where I am with God today. And he brings the church of Laodicea back to this mindset. Listen, you got everything together. You guys even got aqueducts. <laughs> Cold and hot water. But he uses their technology to show them that they've come to a place of just complacency and lukewarmness. And he says, I actually desire to spew that out. Don't want that. I want your life to be repentive. What we believe is that, yes, the sinner can repent and be saved without question. That's why we do what we do. But we also believe that I can fall upon my knees today before God and allow my life today to become more like him that I can have a pureness in my spirit, an improvement in my identity, and the scales taken off my eyes to see what God wants me to see, the ability to hear his knocking. I've made this statement to you before many times, but it's the difference between a visitation and a habitation. The visitation is God has come to the door and he is knocking and you even come to a realization that he's knocking that's a visit the change happens when he's able to come in and sup with you and me that's a habitation of God's presence in my life and my heart and my life before him that says God I'm still lacking I still fall short I'm so thankful, God, for salvation and what you've done in my life. But I still need to repent. From the pulpit to the pew. From the youngest to the oldest. From the Sunday school teacher to the musician to the usher to everybody. We must repent. I never reach a place where I attain the position of not needing to. I never get to that place where I can, I've got it made. I've got it all figured out. That's what this church had reached. And he said, you've got to repent. It's a key word. In this church, in the church of the living God, what we still believe is in the necessity of repentance. A 180 degree turn from where we were going to where we're headed now. God, stir me. Stir me as an apostolic Christian God that I do not allow myself to fall into the trap of complacency and status quo and the mundane and the usual 
and the ordinary. Oh, no, God, don't allow me to reach a place in my spiritual walk where I say I have need of nothing. But rather, change my identity again. Renew my purpose and my motives and my agenda with purity. And open up my eyes, God, that I can see with a fresh and new anointing. Let my ears be sensitive to the knocking of your spirit so that you can come in and sup with me and spend time. God, spend time with me and I with you. Never let me reach a place, God, where repentance is not part of my life as a Christian. Anyone who's here today, anyone who's watching online, Anyone who's never had a walk with God, repentance will change your life. It will give you new hope and a new future. It will take away the past. It will remove all the things from your life that's been held against you by the enemy. It will change your life completely. It works. It works. But also, if you're sitting here, or watching online today, and you're already a Christian, repentance still works. It helps me clear the thoughts, and it helps me clear the motives, and it helps me with my identity and my anointing and the listening of his voice. Stand this morning. What we believe, we believe for the sinner, but we also believe for the saint. We do. It would be absolutely pointless to try to reach all people who do not know the Lord. If we don't also inform those who do to keep walking with him. Getting closer to him. Being more sensitive to him. I'm just going to invite the whole congregation this morning. You just step out of your pews. Make your way to this altar. I'm talking to the church this morning. If we would just step out of our pews and make our way to this altar this morning. Not one person is exempt. Not one person is not a, is immune to the necessity of needing to repent. Every one of us can ask God to check our hearts and check our spirit. Check our attitude. Check our motives. Check our agenda. God, renew our identity with you. The listening of our ear to you, God. The anointing on our life. Every one of us, God, can be brought to a place. God, we just need to repent. We must repent. I must repent. God, I need to. God, I am sorry this morning, God. God, I lay myself on the altar today. I yield myself. I surrender myself to you. My agenda, my motives, my heart, my spirit. I, God, I surrender it all to you. Put the searchlight on my heart today, God. And if there be any wicked way in me, everything that is contrary to your word, everything that is not of you, everything, Jesus, God, that is contrary to you in my life this morning, God, I pray for your forgiveness. I pray, God, for your cleansing. I pray, God, for your cleansing this morning. Oh, God, allow your power and your spirit, Lord, to touch my life today. Touch each person that is here. Each person that has listened this morning, God, the need, the necessity of repentance. Oh, God. Oh, God. It's never changed. It's never got to a place where we don't need to. It's never reached a place where it's not necessary. 
It's never reached a place, God, where we don't need to repent. God, the child of God, the saint of God. Lord, the person that's been in church for however long we need this morning. Lord, to fall on our faces before you, call out to you. God, in an absolute need of repentance today. Everything that I should have did that I haven't done. Everything that I've done that I shouldn't have done. Every thought that I've had, God, that I shouldn't have had. God, I need a cleansing this morning of your power and your presence in my life. Hallelujah, Jesus. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah, Jesus. 